The minute you said that, I thought of all these Eastern traditions and religions that say we are one. And from a scientific perspective, as you say, we very much are one. Yeah, it's what's interesting is <laughs> one of my deep concerns about the world is many philosophies or religions that say we are one, they find some other philosophy that differs and then they go to war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh at that, but it's we're not good at feeling oneness with everyone. It's easy to feel oneness with our tribe. Our tribe could be skin color, religion, who you sleep with, who you don't sleep with, what food you eat, what rituals you perform. And so those people choose sides based on so many factors that I, I, it's actually, to me, just as a scientist, it's disturbing how easily and quickly we will divide each other without and make that the reason for how you interact rather than see what we have in common and make that the reason for why we would come together. This has been really front of mind for me for the last 24 hours. There's been a lot of things that have happened in the news that have thrown the conversation around division to the very front of my mind. And that, you know, in the UK, we've got all these people that are marching next week, I believe, um, through London because of, you know, various political things. And I was saying to my friends last night, I said, I think actually that the root cause isn't this or that, it's the division itself. And it's- Yeah, you can overanalyze. I mean, if you look deeper than whatever people are saying is the reason they are marching or arguing, if you just, um, you know, park the curtains and unpack it all, at the bottom of that is there's a tribe here and a tribe here, and they think this way and they think that way, and never the twain meet unless we rethink how we interact with one another. It's, it's I mean, think about it. You know, with the race, the race friction that existed around the world, but especially in, in colonial Europe and the slave trade and all of this. And, and okay, that's not good. It's bad. Uh, and, all right, but then you look at World War One and World War Two. that's white people fighting white people, slaughtering them in great numbers. So you can divide by skin color, but apparently people find plenty of reasons to divide and conquer, to divide and kill, to divide and oppress. And, and skin color is one in a long list of all the reasons people have given to the religious wars, to worshiping the different God or worshiping the God differently. These are human beings. And, you know, I wrote a whole book, one, I think one of those books in your stash there, that one, yeah, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization, one in your left hand there. That one is, is what conflict in the world looks like when you are scientifically literate and you have a dose of cosmic perspective on top of it. Give me the cosmic perspective, please. It's, you're fighting over that line in the sand when I'm out here at the moon looking at Earth, this fragile ecosystem. Do you realize Earth's atmosphere is to Earth what the skin of an apple is to an apple in terms of thickness? So... Uh, I see people trashing the planet, fighting one another. Again, just based on who's on what side of the line in the sand or who they worship, or who they don't worship, or what their skin color is, or where they were born, what language they speak, what accent they have. And I step back, and from orbit, it's ocean, land, clouds. From the moon, there's Earth suspended there in space. I almost don't want to zoom in on it because people value what they think is true more than what is true. There are objective truths out there, but it's almost as though people fight and argue more vehemently the less evidence there is to support what it is they think is true. Yeah. There's an old saying, if an argument lasts more than five minutes, then both sides are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, it's true probably 80, 90% of the time, but it's something, definitely something to think about. 
How have your spiritual and religious beliefs evolved throughout the course of your career based on all that you've come to know about the objective nature of the universe? Has there been an evolution? It depends on what you mean by evolution. I was raised Catholic. Yeah. But we were raised basically in a secular household, even though we would go to church every weekend. What I mean by that is we come home at no time do either of my parents say, don't do that. Jesus is watching. You keep that up, you'll go to hell. Do this because it'll please God. Never was there such a conversation as that in the household. So the household was driven by objective truths or, or life experience, as would be brought from elders to a next generation. Something that was more common in that generation than in the current generation. Because now elders don't know anything about anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, your kid comes up to you and say, Mommy, Daddy, I want to be a a YouTube influencer, and you're saying, what? Go back to school. No, and then they become a YouTube influencer, and they out-earn you. <laughs> so this, the, the, the divide is greater than ever before between one generation and the next, for sure. But by the time I turned eight, I found the religious teachings less and less convincing. And so by the time I, I was nine, when I discovered the universe, or really the universe discovered me, a first visit to my local planetarium. So yeah, I, I wouldn't call it an evolution, but I will say this. You didn't ask this, but it relates. Before I was more recognized, you know, I'd be on an airplane. What do you do? What do you do? Okay. They find out I do astrophysics. Then out come the questions. Okay. Oh, well, tell me about black holes, relativity, the Big Bang, uh, aliens. Okay. And would always land on God. And I used to give pretty straight unforgiving answers to that question, to that inquiry. But then I thought, that's not fair. There are people whose lives pivot around their religious beliefs and their spirituality. And just because I've been discounting it since I was eight, I shouldn't use that as a force against them. I should at least understand where they're coming from. So I systematically acquired religious books of all kinds. So I have the Torah. I have multiple copies of the Quran. Joseph Smith's account that led to the Mormons. I have uh, multiple uh, bits of literature from Jehovah's Witnesses because they'll come to your door and they want to hand you. So I acquired all these books and I mostly read them. I've skimmed all of them and read some of them with a little more intensity than others. All right. On doing so, that enabled me, empowered me to have more meaningful conversations with people who were religious. Much more meaningful and more informed. That's the key. I don't want to speak about a religion unless I know as much as I can about it. As an academic, that should be what would be true of any subject. You're an academic, you care what's true, not what you think is true, what is true, or what people think, mm. all right? And... There's no doubt that religion has been one of the greatest forces operating on civilization ever since civilization. When you look at as a source of people's behavior, what they eat, like I said, who they sleep with, where they sleep, where they worship, who they worship, all around the world, from animistic native peoples, where there's a spirit energy imbued in the, in the mountain, in the brook, in the wind, to... Uh, the monotheistic religions to the polytheistic religions. The, we don't call them that to put distance between us, but the Greek gods, were it was their religion. We call it mythology. It was their religion. The Greek gods, the Roman gods. So I'm, I'm conversational in all of this. So that when someone says, how do I feel? What do I think? I can do that without just being obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and it's a, it have a meaningful conversation. I haven't done that. You haven't? No, I haven't. I haven't, but it, it's such a good idea to do that, especially as someone in my position that does a lot of talking with people and asking questions. But my, the first thing that sprung to mind was, there was actually two questions that sprung to mind. The first was, how did that change you, reading all those books, outside of you being able to relate um, with those, well, being able to talk to them mm -hmm. in a different way? And the second question, because I've watched Cosmos, I've watched it several times. It's one of my, me and my partner's favorite things to watch is you, you 
going from the very beginnings of time to, through the universe and to where we you are. You gotta love that calendar too. Oh the my cosmic God, calendar. it's my yeah. favorite thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I try and persuade everybody to watch that. But my question was about, because I watched that and I watched um, how the universe has evolved over time, or at least our understanding of it and, and how it came to be, is did humans evolve at some point to believe? Are we meant to believe? Well, so the best way to ask that is, let's go back to the earliest humans we have fossil records of. And we can go back to Neanderthal, for example. Uh, Neanderthal is, is a branch of uh, hominids that went extinct, basically. There's some crossbreeding, and there's Neanderthal DNA in many humans today. But as a, as a branch of, of the hominids, they, they went extinct. So the Neanderthal, then there's Cro-Magnon. Uh, we are you know, Homo sapiens uh, coming after Cro-Magnon. And... So when you look at burial grounds, the Neanderthal bury their dead with things, with parts of their life of the person who died. Now, why would you do that unless you had some belief that there was something more to come for that person? I mean, the, probably the people who took it to the limit were the Egyptians, all right, for the Egyptian royalty. I mean, they bury you with all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, in Greece, uh, I read this. I, I, it's not that I researched it, and I'm, I'm not a scholar in this, but that uh, when they buried you, they put a coin in your mouth or in your hand, somewhere on your body, so that when you got into Hades, you can tip the ferry boat driver to cross the river Styx to get into Hades. You might even say... That's the beginning of what it was to be human when people started thinking that way about dying. Hmm. I mean, you might even invert the question and say, it's not when did we start? It's we existed in all the ways we know ourselves, know what ourselves to be when that ritual came upon our ancestors. And the survival benefit in believing. I, I don't know. Really? Yeah, I I don't know. We we're pretty sure there's a survival benefit of groupthink, and religion is groupthink. If there ever was, it was we will all believe this mm-hmm. in this way, and we will behave in that way on those occasions, and you will not deviate from it. And part of that package of beliefs includes statements about the afterlife and how you should behave in this life. Otherwise, you don't go to heaven, you go to hell. I don't think Judaism has a hell, but you, you, you're you not as rewarded as you'd otherwise be. Now that forms a, a corpus of beliefs that can be highly binding of a people's. And especially if some other people's come up and they do other things and you don't understand it, you don't know what it is, and they're, they're a threat. And so you keep them out, you, you do whatever you can to preserve your traditions relative to theirs. Ultimately, the worst, that in its worst manifestation is all out war. We just kill people who don't believe the way you do. So, so maybe religion is kind of what defined humans in the fossil record. I mean, I, I, like I said, that's an interesting inversion of that question. Not when did humans begin being religious. Mm. You define who we are as humans as when religion showed up in the in the burial grounds of, of cavemen. You just talked about us being bound there by certain shared beliefs and ideas. Yes. And I think increasingly- I think, it, I, I think ritual is one of the strongest binding forces of society that we have. And, and I, I think that people are maybe unbinding. You can, if you look at the narrative in society, it's about be your own boss, stand on your own two feet. More people are lonely, living alone, um, having less kids are working freelance and remotely. So it feels like, in a weird way, we're becoming more independent and there's a somewhat of a cost to that. And actually, my friends that are struggling the most in their lives are those that have the least dependence on a village. So, so I always wonder if people, we need to ladder up to the universe, i.e. me, my family, maybe my village, maybe my country, the planet, the universe. In, in the metaverse? 